Hey guys, how are you doing? This video is about emerging tech trends of 2017. So I know it's still 2016, but we always like to try to look into the future, especially as programmers, to try to figure out where the technology, where the industry is headed. And um, I say tech trends specifically for programmers because there's a lot of things going on uh, in the world that don't involve programming, um, whether it be like architectural stuff or electrical engineering. Uh, a lot of areas that are really cool, space and all that stuff, but in many cases, there's not very much opportunity uh, for programmers to try to, you know, maybe jump into that type of industry. So um, there's going to be, you know, areas that I I probably leave out of this list. Um, and, you know, this list is uh, is just one person's opinion. So if you guys have additional things that I may have missed or you want to add, maybe I said something incorrectly, um, just please leave a comment. I try to approve uh, all comments as long as you're not being like derogatory or racist or something like that. But uh we can um you know we can all talk about you know where where this entire industry is headed into 2017 all right so the first item on this list is the crispr gene editing and this is actually very interesting but unfortunately i'm not very well versed in this sort of thing i'm not a biologist or I'm, i don't know much about molecular life and dna strands and all the different molecules and things that make uh, make up who we are uh, as organisms but um, a lot of work is being done in this industry, not just by scientists, but also with programmers trying to map um, and, and map actual genes. Now, with this CRISPR gene editing, um, what we're looking at is we're actually looking at for the first time being able to um, remap the way our genes are created. So basically, if we have genes that are more susceptible to cancers, um, uh, even different types of hair colors and things like that, uh, there may be a day where we can actually edit those genes to remove those deficiencies, you know, well in advance of ever having any sort of major disease that comes about. Um, so if you want to read more about that, I would definitely suggest, you know, the Wikipedia page just to start, um, although there's probably some uh, inaccuracies in there. But this CRISPR gene editing is definitely something that is uh, is taking the world by storm. In fact, it's one of the um, some people have said it's one of the most important technological advancements um, maybe of the last hundred years. So it's that big. Um, there's tons of money being poured into it. Um, just recently on uh, Engadget here, um, you know, they, Engadget um, had announced that for the first time gene editing is being approved for human trials. So, you know, there's always, you know, when it comes to like stem cell research and stuff like that, there's always a lot of pushback. A lot of people feel very uncomfortable with with humans, um, you know, playing that much of a role in, in the creation of life and things like that. Uh, but it's very interesting. Um, another interesting thing is uh, this Napster guy, the guy, uh, Chris, or Sean Parker, who created Napster, changed the entire music industry, then ended up joining Zuckerberg and Facebook and getting kicked out of Facebook. We all probably know about the movie and everything, but he's a billionaire through all his tech ventures. And um, he started a, a new um, company, um, or co-founded a company that is actually into the CRISPR editing and looking to try to, you know, prevent uh, cancers and try to um, solve cancers. So um, it, it's a, it's an interesting thing for his project. If you want to read more about that, but um, it's good for him that he's going to be able to, uh, you know, be able to push that agenda further now that they're going to allow human trials. Another thing that's very interesting, um, Quantum Magazine just recently came out with an article that scientists uh, in relatively close to where I'm at in Rockville, Maryland, outside of D.C., um, they've essentially created a, a new life form or at least mapped a, um, a synthetic organism, what they have. So basically, organisms are very complicated with the amount of genes and possibilities that those genes um, can encompass to have different you know, traits and things like that. Um, but you can see here that this particular, uh, this, you know, this weird life form only has 473 genes, but they're saying approximately like 30% of them are still unknown to mankind and that, um, you know, there's just not enough information there because they, they, they basically still can't explain how this thing, ha you know, forms or how it lives because there's about 30% of the genes that we just don't understand. Um, and, and some people, you know, they say that, um, you know, that 30% is it, it, even in a, uh, an organism that has just 473 genes, apparently the way the chromosomes and, or and all this stuff works, um, there, there is more possibilities. It's basically, you know, one person equated it to like a, a needle in a haystack with the haystack the size of our entire galaxy. So you're talking about, 
you know, trying to find, you know, that one needle in the entire, ga- you know, universe that's in, that's in obviously incredibly large. But you're talking about that's how complex life is. Um, and even life that is, is as simple as this organism is still, you know, we're, we're still a ways off from ever being able to understand, you know, life and how it forms. Um, but, you know, there is progress being made there. Uh, and, and then by comparison, according to this article, which I found interesting, was that the E. coli uh, bacterium has 4,000 to 5,000 genes. So you can imagine that that is much more, um, much more high tech or much more um, involved than, than this particular gene. And then, you know, humans have 20,000. So if you're talking about a 473 gene uh, organism with 30 percent unknown uh, as far as you know, its mapping, and, and understanding, then um, you know we're obviously a ways off. Even the the, the fastest supercomputers in the world are not going to be able to solve that anytime soon. The next item on the list is cybersecurity. This is a blossoming industry. It's been a, a hot industry for quite some time. We've always had to deal with network security and things like that. But when you look at some of the highest paid programmers in the industry, you're looking at companies like Juniper Networks that's uh, dealing with like uh, you know the RSA credentials and. Uh, their you know, network monitoring and things like that, intrusion detection. A ton of companies, uh, a ton of money is being poured into companies in this industry, literally billions of dollars. And it's not just coming from private uh, companies and backers and investors. It's actually coming from the United States federal government and, and, um, and many other uh, industrialized nations as well. Um, there's all kinds of cyber you know, espionage that's taking place between different countries. Um, it, it causes international relationship problems. Proprietary data is being uh, stolen, uh, pirated, uh, and just, you know, plain, you know, uh, copied. Or, and, and, and really, even beyond that, um, you're having tons of news about, you know, the latest breach of people uh, getting their information stolen, released onto the web. I mean, every company, it seems like um, every major company is dealing with some sort of issue, whether it was Home Depot or the Target hack. Um, or even recently, LinkedIn had me replace my um, my email because apparently, like several years ago, they were hacked, and uh, this information just recently became available. So um, there's all kinds of data breaches going on all over the place. In many cases, it's low-level hackers, and those aren't as uh, as problematic. Uh, but in, in other cases, it's actual cyber warfare uh, from countries that that have hostilities towards each other. So. It's going to be an um, industry that is going to continue to see uh, major, major advancement going into 2017 and beyond. In fact, one article uh, mentioned, in fact, Forbes magazine had mentioned that in 2020, the amount of money being poured into cybersecurity just in, in the year 2020 is estimated to be $140 billion. The next item, and very related to the previous item, but still somewhat different, is the uh, biological authentication. And that's kind of just a name that I um, just kind of came up with on the fly. But what you're seeing now, including my bank just recently came out with an update where I can now log into my bank using my thumbprint. Uh, When I was down in in Disney World and Universal Studios, um, actually Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, they now have thumbprints for all their guests. So when you actually scan your ticket, you give your thumbprint and you use your thumbprint for lockers and things like that. And you're literally talking about a, uh, a place that gets millions of visitors. I don't know how much it is a day, but like it, it, even in April where it wasn't supposed to be busy, there was a ton of people there. Um, so they're able to use this modern technology to authenticate all the, the visitors that are in their parks and literally millions visit every uh, every single, I would imagine, every week. Um, now, th- in addition to just thumbprints, you're seeing a lot of this authentication um, having to be updated just because passwords are a thing of the past or eventually are going to be a thing of the past. Uh, a lot of websites are now just implementing, you know, sign in with Google and sign in with that account and this account and that account. And, and, and the reason why they do that is because, you know, a company like Google can handle their security a little bit better than, you know, a mom and pop shop that is managing a bunch of user accounts. But even beyond that, you know, and that's called OAuth or OAuth 2, um, but even, you know, beyond those standards, we're now looking at, you know, thumbprints, we're looking at uh, iris detectors, um, so, you know, actually looking at your eyeball, uh, maybe facial recognition software. So you're going to see a lot more work being done in the, the you know, biological department when it comes to 
recognizing humans for who they are, uh, where they are, and you know, monitoring inappropriate um, you know, use of credit cards and sign-in locations and things like that. So um, this is kind of in line with the cybersecurity in some ways, but this is more in relation to authentication piece and not just monitoring networks and things like that. So it really is a separate field of study, and it's something that's going to continue to uh, be really popular going into the future. The next item on the list is the so-called Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is a very broad definition. It's a very broad term, uh, and it encompasses a lot of different areas. But essentially, it's about devices, whether it's like wearable devices or it's devices that sit around your house or whatever it may be, um, a car, no matter where you are, if it connects to the Internet, the Internet of Things is all about trying to um, get everything on the web for external monitoring, things like um, you know your refrigerator being able to connect to uh, Amazon for some household groceries when you're running low on milk or you need a new water filter or something like that, that it automatically orders it for you. A lot of people have predicted that um, you know this would take off faster than it has. In some ways, until we get the cybersecurity aspect down, I really feel like this is going to lag behind. Um, I don't want my baby monitor hooked to uh, the internet. I don't want my home security system hooked to the internet. In many ways, you know, if it's hooked to the internet, it's available for hackers to eventually breach it. So they could be watching me, they could be watching my kid. You know, they, there's all kinds of different things that they could do. Um, and I still, I think that we need to focus on the cybersecurity part. But there's still going to be a push for the Internet of Things, trying to get everything connected to the internet. Um, and, and in addition to that, um, we're going to continue to see, uh, like. We're going to continue to see search engines expect data to be formatted in a specific way on the uh, HTML and allowing you know, easier access for you know, parsing, for scraping, and things like that. So um, that's kind of a, a, a separate side piece. But um, what I'm referring to mainly is that um, the Google and other search engines had come out with these item props where you add these tags to your, your HTML pages uh, and even if you have JavaScript rendering the HTML, you still have these tags and it allows the search engines to figure out your data a little bit easier. So with more things connecting to the Internet and being you know, needing access to that type of data and understanding what it's communicating with and what it's trying to uh, accomplish, you know, we're going to probably need uh, a little bit better abilities to be able to share our data and um, allow the web to be, I guess, more easily parsed. The next item is big data and machine learning. So this has been a buzzword for quite some time now, but there is a wealth of data that's stored on all kinds of different mainframe systems, spanning all kinds of different industries, and the data is just sitting there. Where the data, could it be compiled um, easily, it could, you could learn from it, and we could advance a lot of different areas just based on the sheer amount of, you know, the volumes of data that is out there. The problem with big data is that it's very hard to manage and it's very hard to access. So we've seen newer technologies like uh, Hadoop and, and MapReduce and all these different algorithms to try to parse through humongous amounts of data. And we're seeing a lot more companies springing up trying to build, you know, n n not really cognitive machines. Like if you look at IBM Watson, it's supposed to be a cognitive machine, but they know that it's not true artificial intelligence, but there is machine learning involved. So their, their entire thing is that they're supposed to be able to tap into your data, your resources, and if you apply Watson correctly, then it's going to be able to learn from itself and it's going to be able to adapt in ways that your business you know, needs and sees fit. So we're still yet to see true cognitive ability like artificial intelligence, but in order to get there, we obviously need to understand more about genes and, and the origins of life and how the brain works. Uh, but in addition to that, we also need to the, the ability to be able to parse through humongous amounts of data effectively, efficiently, and, and to be able to learn from it. Now, nobody does this better than Google, I would say. Um, if, if somebody truly had a cognitive machine that understood um, factoid questions like, hey, you know, what is the weather going to be like tomorrow? You know, basically, like we know Siri can do that to an extent and Google can do that. But like, you know, um, you know, who shot who in 1786 or something, you know what I mean? Like if, if somebody truly had a cognitive machine that really understood what you were talking about uh, in that regard, 
then I think that they would be competing one-to-one -one with Google on the search engine market. We know that Google has the best results, not just because of algorithms and things like that, but they have the best results because they have the largest user base and they have access to the most data when it comes to figuring out what are people looking for and how to make up for mistakes and things like that that occur within their algorithm. Uh, Google is far from its original page rank algorithm that got them popular back in the mid 90s. This, um, you know, this machine that they have now is much, much more sophisticated. It spans millions of computers, and there's tons of data processing that's going on. And a lot of the the ability of it to be able to understand what it is that you're looking for is just based on the sheer volumes of data. So, if you want to know what big data can do for you, just look at the product that Google has. Now, one of the concerning things about something like that is that as we search the web and as we have our personal ways um, be parsed by companies like Google and Facebook and things like that, it almost creates an unfair advantage for these companies that have access to that, that huge amount of data that eventually they're going to have a, they're, they're going to have so much of an upper hand over the smaller guy that it's just going to be impossible for the smaller guy to be able to compete on that level. Now that's assuming that you know something doesn't come along to level that playing field but um, that is a, a concern going forward just the fact that you have a, a relatively select few amount of companies that have access to these you know substantial amounts of data that they can cater their product towards the next one on our list is geographic information systems or commonly referred to as GIS this is the ability to be able to read um, latitude, longitude points and things like that using GPS and space, but it's ultimately what makes things like Google Maps um, and real-time traffic updates and things like that uh, easily uh, easy to access. So we've seen this as an emerging thing for quite a while, but um, it, it's getting better and better. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, JavaScript libraries that are able to interpret a lot of uh, you know JSON formatted data to be able to display complicated map plots and things like that. So it's not just used for like surveyors that might be interested in property landscapes. You know companies like Zillow are very interested in that to see who owns what properties and stuff like that. Um, it's also very important though for a lot of analytical data, whether it's commercial analytics uh, for where to start your next business or uh, you know, residential, uh, blooming towns, things like that. Maybe looking at, you know, the fault lines for all that, uh, the oil that we're pumping out of the ground using, um, you know, fracking and stuff like that. But there's ultimately tons of reasons why we would want to have geographic information systems and why we want them to be better as our cell phones and handheld devices, uh, you know, get better and better as the technology uh, develops. Google Maps is a very, very complicated and interesting piece of technology. It works great on my Samsung Galaxy S7. Um, I've, you know, I've praised it before. I think it's, uh, it's really great. And a lot of that is made possible using uh, GIST systems. All right, next up on the list is mobile apps. They're still a thing. They're not a thing of the past. We're going to continue to focus on native app development. We've seen a lot of products spring up, like whether it's uh, Microsoft's re recent purchase of Xamarin to make C Sharp more of an attractive language for mobile development, to um, sites like uh, React Native, not really a site, but a framework, React Native, created by the Facebook guys that built the React library. Um, but we're looking at ways of being able to cross-platform, be able to develop in JavaScript and create apps that run on um, you know, Android or iOS. And one of the interesting things about uh, uh, React Native is that you're able to write in JavaScript and that it, uh, it does actually compile natively to like an Android or an iOS, depending on which mar uh, mobile operating system you're targeting. There are still some concerns and head headaches there. Um, the what's called native development is still going to be a very very hot item if you're trying to build an app that is really going to be groundbreaking um, for instance um, one of the apps that I love on my Android is the Skywalk 2 app where I can locate any stars and galaxy clusters in the sky um, in fact with my telescope I actually find myself using the cell phone to identify planets when I was first getting started because I felt it was easier than the, G the GPS system that came with my telescope so um, using a uh, complicated Android app like that that was built natively specifically for that platform, the the actual user experience was flawless. And what uh, I don't know that you're going to continue to see that with things like Xamarin or React Native, um, 
as opposed to just you know writing JavaScript natively that runs on Android, uh, or r writing Swift or Objective C that runs on uh, the Apple iOS. So the the thing is, is mobile apps you know they're more important than ever. Um, Google now has just as much traffic being conducted on their cell phones as they do on actual desktop computers. So as much as we love our desktop computers, a lot of people are accessing the web from their mobiles and their tablets, and uh, these apps are going to continue to provide a better experience than a native uh, you know, standard HTML page that they're accessing on their cell phone. So it's always going to be a... Uh, I, I think that the, the, the demand there is going to be there for, for some years to come. The next big item on our list is virtual reality. So we've all heard about the Oculus Rift. Um, Lucky Palmer, a young kid who was working out of his garage building the first prototype of the Oculus Rift, ends up going to Kickstarter to raise funds to help his project get along. He raises, I think, millions of dollars on Kickstarter, but then ends up selling his Oculus company to Facebook, who swooped in and bought it for over $2 billion in 2014. Since that time, we've been waiting for the release of Oculus. Oculus has been released um, to so-so reviews so far. The actual apps have not caught up, but it is truly an immersive experience. It's something that you definitely have to experience. And it's something that it's not like it's the Nintendo Power Glove or something like that. In certain ways, when you're using it, you're like, ah, this is, you know, you can tell you're dealing with the first implementation of something that's big to come. Um, what I find, I actually have a, uh, a VR headset, which I, I purchased for only $100 that works with my Samsung S7, but it's made by Oculus and I can put it on and, and, and it's truly an amazing experience. It really is. Even though the games suck uh, for the most part, all the games that I played, it's still very incredible that you can turn your head and see different parts of the world um, and you're truly Im you know, immersed in this world. So one of the greatest things that I've seen is actually being able to watch movies and videos using the headset i mean when you're going through like a, a insane asylum and people are jumping out at you and it, it's just creepy i mean you you feel like you're in there it's it's absolutely incredible it's incredible and it's something that's in its infancy it's going to get better and better and now we're seeing a ton of money being poured into this sony's going to release their new vr headset you have the htc vive that's already come out you have oculus that's um the rift that has come out you now have you know the the VR headset for Samsung's uh, Galaxy phone, and you're going to continue to see more and more virtual reality. There's going to be a ton of money poured into this industry. Now, there's still more items that I wanted to mention to you, but I don't want to make this video too long. I feel like it's already too long. Hopefully, you guys are still watching. If you want to know another, uh, or if you want me to create another video that has a few more ideas of emerging technology that I think is coming down the pike. Uh, let me know, and I'd be glad to do that. And um, I do want to mention that in addition to all of this, that if you're a programmer, there's still going to be a ton of money and, uh, and opportunity and, and obviously the web. So uh, the web is not an emerging tech trend or anything like that, but it's something that is going to continue to dominate the industry. That I mean, there's going to be a new framework coming out every single week, and we're going to continue to make web uh, websites different. There's going to be a lot of different trends in that, that regard. But um, that's almost a video unto itself um, as far as all the trends that occur in web development by itself. But this is just a broad overview of just some of the tech trends that I predict for 2017 and beyond. And um, let me know what you guys think. Please subscribe. I appreciate you guys watching. And have a good night. Bye.